Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Michelle Chu, Professor of Intensive Care Medicine at Linköping University Hospital. Uh, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, uh, depending on when you are. Uh, it's a huge pleasure for me to, to share the session with uh, Professor Shu. I'm Professor Nadia Isawi, and I'm working in L'Hôpital Cochin in the Intensive Care Unit of Paris. And uh, we are very excited to share this uh, very wonderful session regarding vasopressor initiation in sepsis. Michel, can I let you introduce how first star? Absolutely. And today uh, we really have a treat for you because we would like to welcome two giants in intensive care medicine. Our first giant is Professor Daniel Debacker, head of ICU at the uh, uh, Chirac hospitals in Brussels. There are two hospitals there. Um, and you will recognize him, of course, from his uh, numerous publications in uh, hemodynamic monitoring, uh, circulatory failure and sepsis. And Professor Debacker will be talking about um, uh, the noradrenaline in a vaso, vasoplegic shock. Welcome. Hello, we will now discuss the uh, first line norepinephrine in vasodilatory shock. Shock, as you know, we have four types of shock and distributive shock or vasodilatory shock is one of these type of shock. So it is really one of the most frequent type of shock we have in the ICU and it is characterized by vasodilation in the vascular system. And so we have a decrease in vascular tone, both in arterial and venous system, resu resulting in vasodilation in both areas. We have also a decrease in sensitivity to endogenous and exogenous vasoconstrictive substances. In addition, we have endothelial dysfunction, which is characterized by impaired microvascular perfusion and, in addition, increased permeability. So we will have to treat these patients by giving some fluid to some extent to replenish the vascular system, but also to consider vasoactive substances and mostly some vasoconstrictor drugs. Among these, norepinephrine is one of these, and we will discuss why we will use norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is acting on the um, alpha receptor and will try to constrict vascular smooth muscle cells in order to try to restore vascular tone. And we know that arterial pressure is a factor independently associated with a poor outcome in patient here with septic shock, which is one of the most common sources of vasodilatory shock. And indeed, the longer the duration of hypotension, the higher the mortality. But it's not just a question of time, it's also a question of severity. As you can see in this very large database, the more severe the hypotension, the shorter the time needed to achieve, unfortunately, a very high risk of death. But as you can see, even more moderate hypotension is also associated with some increased risk of death. So we have to treat hypotension in order to try to prevent this fatal evolution. But one of the very important questions is, does a correction of hypotension with vasopressors affect tissue perfusion? We do not have a lot of data because this is really very complicated to do in humans. And what we can see here in this study from the Claude Martin group is that administering norepinephrine in patients who were severely hypotensive and correcting severe hypotension was associated with restoration of urine output and, more importantly, improvement in creatinine clearance in these patients with septic shock. Also, administration of norepinephrine is associated with some improvement in the endothelial function. So it seems very attractive to give norepinephrine in these patients. Interestingly, we need to think also at the other factors associated with 
administration of vasopressors and in particular norepinephrine. So vasopressors increase preload in septic shock. Here, using transpermal thermodilution data, we can see that administration of norepinephrine is associated with an increase in global and diastolic volume, so the preload of the heart is increased. By the way, this was associated with a slight improvement in cardiac function, and we will see that this was confirmed in other data later on. But indeed, vasopressors increase preload by which mechanism? Well, it's mostly because indeed we have an increase in venous return, which is associated by a, a shift between unstressed volume to stressed volume. And I will illustrate this later on. However, we need to be very cautious that one of the drawback of vasoconstrictive agents is that it may also induce an increase in venous resistances. And then this may unfortunately impair the cardiac output. So in humans, the Bicetre group has nicely demonstrated that norepinephrine both increased mean systemic pressure and the preload of the heart and venous return, and also, on the other hand, increase the resistance to venous return. But globally, the total resulting forces of this was an improvement in venous return and hence cardiac index in these patients. Another important factor is that early introduction of vasopressors may decrease later needs for fluids. Why? If we think at the venous tank, here we have indeed the stress volume and the unstressed volume. And so if we dilate this tank, we have here the vasodilatory aspect on the venous system. We indeed, with the same volume filling these uh, vessels, we have a decrease here in the venous return and hence in cardiac output. So the usual response would be to give volume, to give fluids to these patients in order to restore the venous return and the mean systemic pressure, of course. However, we have to give quite a significant amount of fluids here. By giving early norepinephrine, we resize the venous capacitance bed to its initial size so that we spare some amount of fluids that do not need to be given to indeed restore the venous return. Another very important aspect is that early norepinephrine improves cardiac function. And indeed, this was nicely shown here by Olfa Hamzawi and jean louis Taboul, who demonstrated here that indeed we have, with early introduction of norepinephrine, an increase in cardiac output, which was associated with an increase in insertion fraction, but also some other indices of right and left contractility. And especially you can see here, the S wave on tissue Doppler was improving on the mitral annulus and also on the tricuspid annulus. So improvement in right and left contractility. And so with Michael Pinsky, we debated what could be the mechanism associated with this. And we have a lot of actions due to alpha adrenergic stimulation with increase in mean systemic pressure, increase in coronary pressure, and by the way, the increase in afterload, which improves the contractility by the UNREP effect and also improves the ventricular arterial coupling. Another very important aspect is that we have a small but important beta adrenergic stimulation, which also improves contractility. All these factors increase cardiac output and stroke volume at the early stages with norepinephrine. The impact of early norepinephrine in the classical studies, well, in experimental, experimental conditions, we can indeed see that early norepinephrine introduction spare the amount of fluids that are required to achieve exactly the same hemodynamics in these animals. There was no difference in survival, but lower lactate levels in this early norepinephrine level. In humans, this is more debatable because it's observational data. This, this 
trial here was mentioning that in patients with adequate superfusion, early norepinephrine was not associated with any significant change in organ function score. However, when there was some inadequate superfusion, giving early norepinephrine but perhaps not enough fluids also was associated with an increase in the SOFA score the next day. So we need to be cautious in these conditions. In this Chinese study, we can see that delaying norepinephrine administration was associated with an increase in mortality. Of note, the severity of hypotension in its duration was very severe, and so perhaps a little bit too severe. In a more recent trial, here we demonstrated with Gustavo Ospina uh, that the very early vasopressors was not only associated with a lower amount of fluids that was required to improve the hemodynamics, but also some improvement in mortality in these patients that were compared using a propensity score. In fact, we also need to be careful that early is not immediate, because indeed, we can see that in most of these studies, the medium amount of volume that was already infused was one to two liters in many of these patients. So it is not really exactly when hypotension occurs that in most of the patients, norepinephrine was initiated. It's mostly after a little bit of time. And this is just practical, of course. It's more easy to give volume than just to prepare some syringes with norepinephrine, of course, in patients already in the emergency department. Do we have randomized trials? Well, we have one trial here, the sensor trial in Thailand, where indeed the patients were hypotensive for one hour. And of course, uh, they, these patients had some infection and they begin to have the therapy of the infection there. Then a fixed dose of norepinephrine was given for 24 hours. And then some volume was um, done to try to achieve mean arterial pressure. And if not, there was some open label norepinephrine that was administered. So a little bit of complex design here. And by the way, what was observed is that there was a more early control of blood pressure. Here. But more early, it's only one hour difference, so maybe not a major one. Nevertheless, there was a trend to an improved survival in these patients more rapid decrease in lactate, less primary edema, less arrhythmia. Very promising, but a very specific design with a fixed dose of norepinephrine again. Uh, this is perhaps not exactly what we expect. The Clover's trial is addressing this aspect of early norepinephrine versus liberal fluids. And this study is over, not yet published, uh, and stopped for futility. We really need to look at the details to know exactly why there was no difference. We may have some debate later on in the discussion about this aspect, but obviously no major effect in the context where this trial was performed. And this is why <coughs> we recommend in this paper when we look at the individualization of care, that indeed we should individualize the initiation of vasopressor therapy. In some patients, fluid preloading may be considered, but these are mostly the less severe cases, while co-loading of fluids and vasopressors should be preferred in case of more severe hypotension or low dietary pressure. Then why norepinephrine as my preferred agent? Well, it's not my preferred agent. It's just the guidelines that indeed recommend norepinephrine as a first line agent over other vasopressors. Why? Because indeed norepinephrine is mostly alpha-1 agent with limited beta-1 and a little bit of beta-2 effect. And this is crucial because compared to other adrenergic vasopressors, these have marked B2 and B1 effect, and this perhaps would be not as beneficial as it could be for norepinephrine. And indeed, if we look again experimentally, we can see that norepinephrine, compared here to epinephrine and phenylephrine, is associated with better preserved cardiac output, but more importantly, better preserved cardiac function and less tachycardia compared to other agents. So better cardiac function, better 
uh, her trade and at the end, the better catacot, but so a better human profile, at least experimentally. In humans, well, perhaps dopamine can do better in terms of catacot, but at least initially, because later on, we can see that there is no major difference in catacot. We tested the dopamine versus norepinephrine. We have a lot of data here. Initially, in observational data, we found that dopamine is associated with increased mortality. Not observed in other trials, so we did that randomized trial where we exposed maximally the patient to the study drug, either dopamine or norepinephrine. And of course, to count for the less potent activity of dopamine, we have added open label norepinephrine. And our results were here in the context of a trend to an improved outcome with norepinephrine. Not significant, admittedly. But in cardiac shock, Obviously, there was a significant improvement in, in outcome. The same direction, but not significant with septic shock. So less arrhythmias, definitely with norepinephrine compared to dopamine. Interestingly, when we do meta-analysis in septic shock, there is an improvement in the outcome with norepinephrine compared to dopamine. And perhaps the most important data, real-life data, when there was a shortage in US, in norepinephrine, of course, our norepinephrine was less used in these conditions. But the most important aspect is that during that period, there was an increase in the mortality in these units that resulted when norepinephrine was again available in these units. So obviously, it's interesting to realize we have exactly the same survival benefit in our randomized trial in the meta-analysis and in the real life. So this is really a very strong signal that norepinephrine is the best vasopressor agent. About epinephrine, again, we have some data, but again, norepinephrine and epinephrine both are alpha adrenergic agents. So we act on the same receptor. The, same dif the sole difference is that we have a beta simulation which is much stronger with epinephrine. And the advantage is that it might increase the flow, but you can see that it is really at low dose that this is observed. At higher doses, it is really minimized. And importantly, the adverse effects are present mostly at higher doses. And when we use it at a vasopressor, we will mostly use high doses. And this may increase lactate levels. And this may indeed also induce some tachycardia. Interestingly, you can see that these ages are totally identical in terms of potency, in terms of ability to correct hypertension. However, more tachycardia, lower pH, higher lactate levels. In terms of mortality, maybe no major difference, even though there was here a trend that was quite, seen, quite important. But remember again, that in that, this, that trial, it was mandatory to have five micrograms per kilogram per minute of the butamine. It was mandatory to have it, and it was used for several hours, even when not needed for cardiac output. This is really a major drawback of that trial. And also the other trial, the Australian one, again showing increased heart rate, increased lactate levels. Importantly, a lot of patients were withdrawn from the study by the clinician. Why? Because indeed, mostly, there were some arrhythmias and other important adverse effects. And all these patients received open label norepinephrine after. So this means that this is very important as a limitation of epinephrine is there because we cannot use epinephrine in one sixth of the patient because of adverse events. And it can really shock also very dangerous signals with more refractory shock with epinephrine compared to norepinephrine. And the increase in risk of death here, which was not significant, but at least here at 28 days, at um, seven days was significant and stops to the further inclusion of patients in that trial. So at the end, we have to remember that we can also select other agents, not vasopressor agents, because indeed, instead of acting on the alpha receptor, we will act on the other receptor. 
the vasopressin receptor, and this will be covered by Pierre Aspar in a couple of minutes, but also the angiotensin receptor. Remember that outside the fact that we have a different receptor, the inner signal is exactly the same with simulation of G protein increase in intracellular calcium. So the same aspect inside the cells. So differences between the agents will arise due to receptor sensitivity, disposition in vascular system, as well as stimulation of the other receptors, beta receptors, V2 receptor, and others. And with this, I will conclude mentioning that timing of initiation of vasopressors should be individualized and based on severity of hypotension. Immediate initiation is probably not justified unless the patient is close to a cardiac arrest. But early initiation should be considered in patients with severe hypertension and low diastolic pressure. Norepinephrine should be the first time vasopressor agent. It is usually well tolerated and is associated with favorable humanic effects. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this great uh, talk. So if you have some question, please uh, ask your question by, by chat and we will, try, we will try to answer to your question at the end of the second session. So now it's a huge honor for me to introduce uh, the Professor Pierre Asfar, working in the ICU of Angers in l'hôpital um, universitaire d'Angers. So if you wrote some papers, some very important papers regarding hemodynamic and sepsis shock, you should know Pierre Asfar. He did, he contributed a lot regarding hemodynamic and sepsis, and he published at least 200 papers on these topics, especially sepsis spam in the New England Journal of Medicine 2014, and uh, hyperdosis in Lancet, it was uh, three years later. So Pierre is, Pierre Asfar, the Professor Asfar, is going to talk about uh, early uh, vasopressing in refractory and non-refractory sepsis shock. So Pierre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nadia, for this uh, kind introduction. I would like to thank the uh, European Society of Intensive Care Medicine for the invitation. And I, Oh, it doesn't run. Ah, okay. So I have no conflict of uh, interest, and I will start by basic physiology uh, regarding the vasopressin synthesis, which is uh, performed in the hypothalamus, and the, then vasopressin is stored in the posterior uh, part of the uh, hypophysis. So when the hypertension occurs, uh, vasopressin is released and act via V1 agonist receptor on smooth uh, vascular cell to induce uh, vasoconstriction and have a special action uh, on uh, kidney with two, both two mechanisms, sorry. Uh, the first one, the glomerular, glomerular filtration rate is increased due to the increase in uh, mean arterial pressure, but also there is a specific vasoconstrictive effect on renal affer efferent arteriole when the which allows the increase in uh, glomerular filtration rate. Uh, vasopressin has uh, effect via V2 a, uh, agonist receptors and uh, these, are, these are unattended and uh, not desired, such as uh, uh, platelet aggregation uh, in vessels. What happens during uh, shock? Uh, normally, vasopressin is released, and uh, on this slide uh, published by uh, Landry a uh, long time ago, uh, you have the comparison of plasma vasopressin in patients with septic shock and patients with cardiologic shock. They were compared at the same level of mean artery pressure. As uh, shown, you can see that patients with septic shock have rather low level of uh, vasopressin despite a 
decreased uh, mean arterial pressure as compared with patient with uh, uh, cardiogenic shock. So there is some kind of uh, uh, relative deprivation of uh, vasopressin during septic shock. And this was uh, confirmed by many studies. What happens when you infuse a very low dose of uh, vasopressin, such as uh, 0.04 uh, unit uh, per minute, which are without effect in healthy volunteers, without, without uh, pressor effect on uh, healthy volunteers, but in patients with uh, septic shock, uh, administration of very low dose of uh, vasopressin uh, induce an increase in mean arterial pressure and a decrease uh, of uh, or decrease in cardiac output associated with increase in vascular systemic vascular resistances. So uh, sometimes there are, there is a uh, effect on heart rate with a decrease uh, of uh, uh, heart rate, but uh, it depends on uh, the trials. Now I will uh, uh, report you four studies uh, where vasopressin or V1 agonists were uh, compared face to face with uh, norepinephrine, which is given usually as first uh, vasopressor agent as uh, has uh, talked uh, um, Daniel. And uh, the first one was uh, the, the trial called uh, VAST. It was released in uh, 2008 and compared patient to septic shock and they have received the 0.03 unit uh, per minute and patient were recruited within the first 24 hours after the beginning of the septic shock. They were stratified on severity uh, according to the concentration of uh, epinephrine at inclusion. And the global result is there is no uh, difference or superiority of uh, vasopressin on norepinephrine in this trial uh, where uh, more, uh, almost uh, 800 patients were recruited. However, when we look at the less severe patients, those who received uh, less than 15 micro per minute at inclusion, there was a significant difference at day 28 as well as at 90 days. So this, there was no effect on mortality in the more severe patients. So in the less severe patients, there was a beneficial effect of vasopressin uh, compare, as compared to norepinephrine. Regarding the side effect, uh, there was uh, no significant uh, difference between uh, both uh, drugs, but uh, as you can see, there was a little bit more digital ischemia in patient treated with uh, vasopressin. There was no protective effect uh, uh, on uh, arrhythmia. And uh, this slide from the vast trial report, uh, the uh, decrease of uh, norepinephrine administration in open level, uh, and uh, it, uh, the infusion of vasopressin allows the decrease of uh, norepinephrine infusion rate and act as a sparing effect on norepinephrine. The second trial has compared face-to-face -face vasopressin, but uh, vasopressin first or norepinephrine first, and vasopressin was uh, given up to 0.06 uh, my, uh, unit per minute. The global result of uh, this uh, trial uh, where the uh, uh, main outcome was uh, the patients who never developed kidney failure within the 28th first day, and there was no significant difference. Interestingly, there is a signal uh, regarding the secondary outcomes, and uh, patients treated with uh, vasopressin required less uh, renal replacement therapies. Regarding the side effects, uh, there was a little bit more 
digital ischemia in patients treated with uh, vasopressin, and there was no significant difference in life-threatening arrhythmias in both groups. Here also, the author report a decrease of uh, norepinephrine given as open label drug, uh, reflecting the sparring effect of uh, vasopressin to re in order to reduce uh, uh, norepinephrine infusion rate. So this uh, is the third study. Uh, and uh, it is a brother of uh, celepressin of uh, vasopressin which was uh, studied it uh, was called it is called celepressin it was thought to have uh, less uh, side effects and uh, maybe uh, prevents um, capillary leakage and so it was tested in patients with um, uh, septic shock and uh, the difference, the, the tr sorry, the trial was uh, uh, stopped prematurely for futility. And as you can see, there was no difference uh, in terms of uh, uh, ventilation or vasopressor three days. And the mortality rate was uh, similar in both groups, uh, celeprosin versus uh, uh, norepinephrine. So uh, the, there was no difference in terms of adverse events in this trial. The, the rate of uh, peripheral ischemia was uh, the same in both uh, groups. And here also there was a sparing effect of uh, um, no epinephrine. It's the panel, the right panel, and. Uh, when celepressin is uh, given, it allows the reduction of open label uh, not epinephrine, uh, supporting a sparring effect of uh, celepressin. And the last drug is uh, telepressin, uh, which was uh, compared as first uh, vasopressor agent versus uh, not epinephrine. In uh, this trial published in intensive care medicine in 2018, there was no difference in terms of uh, mortality between both groups, but there was uh, much more digital ischemia in patients treated with uh, terlipressin. So, this uh, trial were uh, gathered in um, uh, meta-analysis and uh, this one uh, reported by Mike entire in JAMA in 2018 gathered patients with septic shock but also patients with uh, vasodilatory shock so uh, it's a melting of uh, patients and in this uh, meta-analysis uh, mortality was uh, in favor of uh, vasopressin alone or in association with uh, uh, no epinephrine and the uh, atrial fibrillation rate, the de novo atrial fibrillation was lower in patients treated with uh, uh, vasopressin. Uh, regarding the effects of uh, vasopressin on uh, renal replacement therapy requirements, uh, there was uh, no significant effect and the author reported significant increase in patients with uh, uh, vasopressin, uh, the use of no epinephrine was rather protective. Another uh, meta-analysis uh, done with the individual patient uh, data, uh, which gathered uh, the vast vanish and vanks trials mainly, report no effect on uh, mortality. Uh, no effect in terms of uh, adverse event and uh, potential benefit uh, in favor of uh, V1A agonist with uh, regarding the requirement of uh, renal replacement, replacement uh, therapies. So maybe an effect on uh, kidney. What tell us the surviving sepsis campaign? They recommend, as Daniel has, has said, uh, the use of uh, no epinephrine as uh, first line agent, but they recommend uh, with uh, 
moderate uh, quality of evidence, uh, the use of vasopressin, and they recommend a threshold be to start vasopressin between 0.25 and 0.5 micro per kilo per minute of uh, uh, no epinephrine. So uh, this uh, value of uh, 0.5 to say it roughly it comes uh, from different uh, trials, but uh, questions uh, the real concentration uh, of the threshold of uh, starting as uh, no epinephrine. Indeed, it's not sure that uh, uh, value expressed in uh, randomized control trial are expressed in norepinephrine based or norepinephrine target, which is largely or widely used in uh, in Europe. And uh, in Germany, for instance, they use also norepinephrine hydrochloride. And as you can see, uh, concentration as compared with uh, norepinephrine base is not the same. Roughly, uh, no epinephrine tart rate is twice of uh, no epinephrine base. So it's important when we uh, treat patient according a threshold for starting the no epinephrine to have to keep these uh, differences in mind. When uh, we ask uh, uh, intensivists in mainly in Europe, uh, as uh, shown in this. Uh, um, study uh, led by Thomas Shurin, uh, you can see that uh, mo most of the European intensivist does not use uh, a threshold to start uh, vasopressin uh, infusion in patients with the septic shock. Only a minority of them use uh, the threshold of, uh, of uh, norepinephrine to start vasopressin. And uh, when uh, the panel of uh, experts is asked uh, to define what is a uh, refractory hypertension, they do, there's no consensus as uh, they did not answer this uh, question because uh, most of them probably no, not use uh, a threshold of uh, no epinephrine to start uh, vasopressin infusion in patients with uh, septic shock. So uh, the same authors have stated that uh, research is needed to identify clinically relevant thresholds for consistency of guidelines and for design of future clinical trials. And uh, was of the most renowned uh, specialist uh, in vasopressin, which is uh, Jim Russell, uh, has stated that uh, uh, the patient responsive or not responsive to vasopressor is not well defined, but uh, generally, generally means not responsive to a high dose. So uh, this uh, the slide from Gessi uh, is uh, very interesting. It uh, reports or depicts the, the causes of uh, patient with uh, refractory shock. Uh, and uh, for uh, this author, and I share this opinion, a refractory shock is rather a continuous increase without response to uh, no epinephrine. And maybe there is a room for the use of uh, vasopressin in such situation. Uh, of note, these patients have very poor outcome and uh, it's not the same uh, dynamics uh, as compared with patients who require high dose, but there are uh, uh, <laughs> there are uh, uh, rather well controlled and stabilized with even uh, rather high doses of uh, no epinephrine. So to conclude. Uh, regarding mortality outcome, vasopressin is not superior to norepinephrine. Uh, low dose of vasopressin allow to decrease norepinephrine requirement as sparring effect and uh, may be used to decatecholamine uh, patients. Regarding renal and safety outcomes, vasopressin may 
I insist on the may improve renal function and may decrease de novo uh, atrial fibrillation and may favor uh, ischemic uh, events. And the best timing of vasopressin infusion remains unclear, at least for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre. So just to summarize how two talks, uh, I, I do apologize for summarizing such uh, big work. So Daniel de Bacter uh, talked about first-line norepinephrine in vasoplegic shock. So the main message I think are early norepinephrine is benefit for how patients having vasodilatory shock regarding uh, preload and cardiac output uh, pharmacologic property. And norepinephrine allows also to avoid volume overload. So norepinephrine is a first line therapy. Early therapy does not meet immediate therapy. And uh, there is no clinical situation except cardiac arrest, which justifies first line um, vasopressor without uh, fluid resuscitation. Pierre uh, presents, presented us uh, some alternative to uh, norepinephrine. He explained us the dark side of norepinephrine. The other agents, uh, especially vasopressin, uh, did not improve the outcome, but vasopressin uh, increases, uh, sorry, decreases the, the norepinephrine recruitment. It may have a um, more benefit effect on kidney, but uh, maybe more ischemic events, maybe especially in patients with atherosclerosis. And uh, we definitely need some study regarding the threshold. Last, um, refractory, non-refractory, uh, uh, severe uh, shock. So it's a continuum and uh, some patients may benefit from early uh, vasopressin which patient we still don't know. Thank you very much. And now we are going to ask him to your question. Michelle? Great. Thank you very much um, for summing that up, uh, Nadia. And thank you, Professor Sidabak and Ashva, for uh, summarizing all the evidence to date for us. Um, so firstly, a question for Dr. Debacker uh, from the chat. What is the level of hypotension um, that could be considered as a cutoff. Uh, perhaps this is also a question for Professor Ashva, given that you did the sepsis PAM study. And when when would you start vasopressors and what is the meaning of early? So <clears throat> there are a lot of questions there. So for the cutoff, uh, I mean, the severity is uh, crucial uh, indeed to, to, to decide whether or not to initiate right away the uh, norepinephrine and 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 often we go for in sepsis or vasodilatory shock because it's often associated with a low diastolic uh, pressure even with some sustained systolic pressure so diastolic pressure at 40 uh, below 40 we initiate um, norepinephrine and the mean arterial pressure is somewhere between 55 and 60 depending on patient condition i mean if the patient is uh, awake and um, is um, able to communicate, perhaps um, we can tolerate 55 and try to begin other things. If the patient is not awake, then uh, above 60, 60, I will begin, uh, below 60, I will begin the vasopressors. Regarding early, I mean, definition of early is really um, within some minutes of hours. I mean, it's not uh, discussing early when we discuss something at um, six hours or 10 hours. So early is within the few minutes on, on admission of, uh, in the emergency department or in the ICU if the patient is coming from the ward. Uh, but um, this means that uh, we evaluate rapidly the patient and we decide rapidly whether or not we can wait a little bit um, institutional vasopressors, or we have to right away begin it uh, together again with a volume recitation, which is crucial in these conditions. Okay, well, thank you for that. And this ties in with your message of personalized or individualized therapy. Look at the patient, take into account all the hemodynamic parameters that you have, including the diastolic blood pressure. Thank you. So uh, I have a question now from the chat for uh, Professor Ashva. Um, the surviving sepsis campaign uh, advises that you commence uh, vasopressin once you have reached a particular threshold for noradrenaline. 
um, and suggested uh, that uh, it may be more beneficial, this is from the VAST trial, in patients with less severe sepsis. I guess this was an unexpected finding. Do you think we're using vasopressin in the right patient group? Uh, it's a problem. To, uh, I have a lot of uh, difficulty to answer this, uh, uh, this question as you, you told it. Uh, the most or the more beneficial effect in patients with septic shock are in less severe uh, patients. And uh, it's made probably as Jim Russell has uh, already stated that uh, it is possible in such patients to win them rapidly from uh, norepinephrine and to avoid completely the side effect or the uh, detrimental effect of uh, norepinephrine or catecholamine. So mm -hmm. in these patients, uh, the vasopressin seems uh, useful. However, it's a secondary outcome of the VAST trial, and I think it would be important to confirm uh, this uh, result in selected group of patients with uh, low uh, uh, no epinephrine uh, requirements. Okay, um, so that's that's a good answer because this is something that uh, that we we often get asked by uh, clinicians around the world. Well, following from that, there is another question in the chat asking whether or not, um, in any situation, would you consider vasopressin as a first line agent? Uh, with the result I have shared you shared with you, I think there's no room today to start with uh, with vasopressin. We have uh, not enough uh, scientific sounded uh, uh, materials to to start with first line vasopressin. Yeah. Yeah. Pierre, may I ask you: Is there any situation which? contraindicates strictly vasopressin. I mean, do you think that a patient with severe arterial disease is an absolute contraindication to vasopressin? Uh, I don't know. I do, I do not know. Uh, in uh, the trials who recruited the patient uh, with septic shock, uh, uh, high number of these patients were hypertensive with atherosclerosis, so they were not ruled out uh, and they were uh, recruited in this trial. So I think that it's more important to try to select patient according the uh, vasoplegic status rather than the comorbidities. However, when they are a very at very high risk of um, uh, mesenteric ischemia, for instance, they come from uh, so they were excluded from uh, RCTs. So uh, these patients should not be treated with uh, vasopre vasopressin yeah. as they were excluded. So the difficulty is to identify patients. Yes which are at risk to develop mesenteric ischemia. Sometimes we have some previous history, some uh, CT regarding uh, abdominal vascular, but it's not so so easy. But huh? maybe my, my question is not so relevant because uh, such patients are always have always a lot of comorbidity. So the, the, the question to, to continue the, the the, um, the, the, the recitation may depend on other uh, parameters. You, you are right. Thank you, Pierre. Okay, there are lots of uh, questions in the chat. This is excellent. Thank you very much for your questions. This Here is one for Daniel, um, and I know you alluded to this in your uh, lecture. What about uh, cardiogenic shock as opposed to septic shock? What is your uh, take on vasopressors and, and I guess inotropes there as well? <coughs> So it's, uh, it's of course, uh, there is often in cardiac shock a vasodilatory component. This is why indeed vasopressors are needed um, and uh, intropic agents cannot do the job in isolation. Um, and we have to be very careful about the potential detrimental effects um, of our vasopressors 
on Kardec output on one hand and on Kardec function and ischemia on the other hand. Um, in other ways, the price to pay uh, to correct hypotension in these conditions. So our practice is to initiate usually with a norepinephrine um, and to have a separate action on cardiac output with some atropic agents. And I usually use uh, the butamine as a first line because it's easily titrable. I mean, you can rapidly escalate or de-escalate if you observe adverse events. Um, and then, of course, discuss um, other agents like uh, uh, mirinone or and or levosimodon. And of course, um, if you have to discuss a very severe canary shark patient, always keep in mind uh, mechanical support, which is uh, always um, behind the door uh, if the patient is not uh, responding uh, rapidly um, to uh, these agents. Um, and um, uh, regarding the blood pressure management, uh, it's uh, very complex there because um, we often begin with norepinephrine. We pay attention to her trait, um, and um, uh, it is really where, uh, in my mind, with the risk of um, tachycardia and especially tachyarrhythmias, uh, discussion on rapid initiation of uh, vasopressin der derivative may be considered because indeed uh, this can be useful when the heart rate is really um, um, leading to arrhythmias and other stuff like this. So it's um, um, it's, it's it's something to have in mind. Is again personalized is uh, really the key word because it's difficult to have any cutoff of um, any drug level or heart rate or whatever there, but it's really pay attention to the response of the patient, which is a, a crucial aspect. All right, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. That that sounds very sensible. And of course, one of the other important messages I got from your lecture is the avoidance of adrenaline where, where possible. Mm. We had a lot of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the participants. A question for you, Pierre. Um, when do you consider hydrocortisone in a septic shock patients? Do you consider hydrocortisone before introducing vasopressin, for an example? So, uh, it's not the topic of our... Uh, ah, sorry. <laughs> but but I, I will answer, I will answer. I know uh, you, you know the topics uh, because you uh, global, Globally, uh, hydrocortisone have sh has shown a beneficial effect uh, in some trials, there was no effect on uh, mortality, but uh, uh, tendency, and uh, roughly there is no major side effect. So it's a relatively safe uh, uh, drug. Okay. Uh, the trial uh, who, uh, which has shown beneficial effect is the approach study uh, from Jilali Anan, and patients were recruited within the 24 first hours. So we have time to start uh, uh, hydrocortisone. And uh, when you look at the baseline characteristics of patients, patients were recruited with uh, a, 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 a mean of uh, one, more than one uh, micro per kilo okay. and per minute. So they had, they have already high dose of uh, norepinephrine and uh, there, in this trial there is a beneficial effect on mortality uh, in patients who were treated in the hydrocortisone arm. So in the most severe patients when I increase norepinephrine I think to use uh, 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 hydrocortisone. And the protocol in our department is at uh, one micro. Okay. So for, you yeah. Yeah. for you, it belongs on the management of septic shock patients, but it does not uh, modify your strategies regarding uh, vasopressors. We, we still had a lot of questions, so I just want to ask a question regarding the winning because uh, some of you are asking uh, the same question. I don't know, it's Daniel or Pierre, maybe both. Um, what is your strategy regarding the winning of uh, norepinephrine and vasopressin when the patient benefited from the two uh, drugs? 
Do you start by vasopressin, for example, to avoid ischemic yeah. effects? Does it depend on, for an example, um, probably arrhythmia side effects? So what is your strategy? Do you have a, a strict protocol or does it depend on your patient? Does it depend on your patient? Sorry. So we, we have data to answer this question. And uh, as uh, to the best of my knowledge, the most uh, important is to start uh, uh, the winning of norepinephrine first and then to stop very progressively uh, vasopressin. In this strategy, you avoid uh, rebounds of, uh, or drops or brutal drops of uh, uh, mean artery pressure. Uh, I don't know if uh, Daniel has a different opinion, but uh, the data we have recommend rather to start with this, the weaning of uh, norepinephrine first. In Italy, I prefer to again individualize the, the situation. I mean, and um, uh, everything would depend on the doses of, um, of, of each agent. So if you have a high dose of norepinephrine you need first to decrease high dose um if you have just a 0.02 or 0.3 of uh, vasopressin if you uh, have a 0.3 or 0.4 vasopressin i would prefer to be with lower doses of vasopressin and then to to to, to decrease also the other one so also as um, nadia mentioned i mean taking into account um, um the uh, uh, arrhythmias uh, taking into account the cardiac output we have taking into account many other factors so uh, i think it's very difficult to have um, a single strategy that uh, you have to follow each time i think that uh, globally it's indeed you have less hypotension when you stop norepinephrine first than when you stop vasopressin first but it may just be related to um, other factors including the half life of the product and um, and perhaps also the the dose escal uh, de-escalation that is done in 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 a row um, and i mean uh, and sometimes people are a bit uh, too brutal and and i we have seen that also um sometimes uh, the um um artificial intelligence driven um system may prevent this kind of hypertension because sometimes there are already signs that we neglect at the bedside that are indicative that a further decreasing norepinephrine will lead to hypertension. Okay, well, thank you both for that answer. So uh, some very good data suggesting that um, uh, we we should limit the uh, deleterious effects of catecholamines as well as looking at the patient. You know, if you've obviously got a patient with lots of arrhythmias, you'd want to reduce the noradrenaline first. So, uh, so, so thank you for that. Now we have time for one last question. I'm really, really sorry that we don't have time to answer all of them. Please write to Nadia and myself if you have any questions and we will try and answer them and forward them as well to uh, Professor Stebak and, um, and Professor Ashwa. Um, so Daniel, a last question for you. Is there a role for starting low dose peripheral vasopressors? Well, uh, it's better to begin peripherally than to keep the patient hypotensive. However, um, in, I, I really think that uh, patients who will require significant doses of vasopressors will have benefits from central lines for because they will receive a lot of other drugs they will also have the possibility to measure cvp to measure uh, svu2 and these are important information that cannot be gathered without this uh, central line so um for safety it's good not to be uh, too long with a peripheral um, access but uh, it's better to give it um, peripherally initially than not to giving it at all Excellent. Thank you. Professor Ashwa, any, uh, any comments to that? I fully share uh, the Dan Daniel opinion. If we, it should be better to start very early, uh, no epinephrine, even on peripheral line and to switch as soon as possible with the central line. And there is no uh, fair, uh, care for a patient with, uh, septic shock without central line. 
Great. Thank you very, very much, uh, Pierre Asfar and Daniel De Backer, uh, to, to, to cover the, the topic, to give us so much data and so clear messages. Thank you very much to all participants, which, uh, who allowed us, uh, uh, to be very interactive. And thank you to my favorite, uh, co-chairwoman, Michelle Shu for this great session. Thank you very much. Thank you, the uh, IECM, uh, for the organizing such session. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. And I don't know if we can say enjoy the, the end of the year and Merry Christmas. Maybe it's too soon. Michelle, the last words? Never too late. Happy holiday season, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Pierre. And thank you, Nadia. Always a pleasure to be with you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.